Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new here, welcome. Today we're going to be focusing on something a little bit different as this is actually a solved case and there was never much of a mystery surrounding it, but there is an interesting conversation to be had. We're going to be exploring the murder of a man called Daniel Spencer and the use of the gay or LGBT panic defence, a legal strategy in which a defendant can claim they acted in a state of violent temporary insanity or diminished capacity because of unwanted same-sex sexual advances. That the thought of someone of the same sex making advances on them provoked them into acting in self-defence, leading to a serious assault, or as in today's case, murder. This is a defence most often used by straight men to justify hate crimes, and the worst thing is, is that it can work. Daniel Spencer was a 32-year-old man who'd moved from Los Angeles to Austin, Texas in 2014, about a year before his death. He'd graduated from the University of Oklahoma with a fine arts degree and had been employed in Los Angeles as a digital film editor with a firm base in Marina del Rey. Daniel mostly edited TV commercials and he'd relocated to Austin in an attempt to help his company establish a presence in the city. He was a good employee who had apparently sent his boss handwritten thank you notes after receiving pay rises and bonuses, so he was thoughtful. Daniel had recently met James Miller at an East Austin bar that was frequented by musicians. Daniel was apparently a very talented musician playing the saxophone, guitar and piano, and James Miller had recently taken up guitar after he retired from his job as an Austin police employee. I'm not sure he was a police officer, but he definitely worked within the police in some capacity. The night of the crime in September 2015 was only the second time the two of them had met. They'd first met at the bar in East Austin, as I said, and they'd bonded there over their love of music. Apparently James was so impressed with Daniel's talents that it had even invited him to audition to join his jazz band. And after discovering that they only lived around the corner from each other, they'd organised to meet up at Daniel's apartment to play together. On the night in question, the pair had been drinking, and according to James Miller, they'd had a pretty nice night. It is worth bearing in mind that the narrative of what happened this night is entirely one-sided. There was no one else there to be witness to what happened except for Daniel himself, and he sadly died. We'll likely never know what truly happened. But James Miller has said that the two played together for about six hours before he got up to leave and head back to his truck to go home. But apparently before he reached his truck, he realised he'd forgot his reading glasses and returned to the house. And that's apparently where things took a turn. Allegedly, Daniel leaned in for a kiss at this point and James responded with, hold it, I'm not a gay person. Very interestingly, according to NBC News, the prosecutor in this case denies any reports that Daniel was even a gay man. Friends and family all testified that he was heterosexual, although of course I can't tell you how true that is. Maybe Daniel was in the closet, maybe not, we don't know. As I said, Daniel isn't here to testify to his story. And there isn't loads of coverage about this case we found online, I wish I could delve more into it, but the information about Daniel as a person just isn't really there. James has said that when he tried to leave, Daniel started yelling at him and waving his hands around. According to the statesman, when asked if they fought, James said no, but some sources say that he said Daniel came at him with a drinking glass. Prosecutors would later say that James didn't have so much as a single scratch on him. But he claims that in self-defence, he pulled out a knife and stabbed Daniel to death, twice in the back, later confirmed by the medical examiner. A few hours later, at 3.45am, James Miller turned up at the police station and turned himself in, saying, I think I killed someone, I stabbed him. He brought the police to Daniel's apartment where they found his body just inside the front door, cold to the touch. The crime scene was fairly bloody with large amounts of blood found in the kitchen and in the hall next to the front door. At Miller's house, they found several items of clothing that appeared to have been cleaned with bleach and they also found a blood-stained knife in his trouser pocket. When asked at the station why his clothes weren't blood-stained, he replied, 
I couldn't come down here with all the blood on me. That very same day, he was arrested and booked into the Travis County Jail, held on a bail of a quarter of a million dollars. Miller said that he feared for his safety because Daniel was coming on to him, and James was apparently double Daniel's age and eight inches shorter than him, at just 66 years old and five foot four. The trial didn't take place until early 2018, at which point the defence would argue that James was intimidated. They also admit there was no fight or struggle between the two. Daniel didn't touch Miller at any point, nor did he state any intention to hurt him, and that's from Miller's own mouth. The prosecution would argue at trial that the blood evidence didn't match the defence's theory in this case, and the fact that Daniel was stabbed twice in the back suggests that his back was turned at the time. If the story is that Miller stabbed him because he was trying to kiss him and coming at him aggressively with a glass, how did he manage to stab him in the back? This would suggest that Daniel's back was turned and he wasn't coming for James at all. What many say the defence used in this case is something called the gay panic defence, a rarely used but still very much legal defence in a number of states and countries around the world. The gay or trans or LGBTQ plus panic defense is where the victim's sexual orientation or alleged sexual orientation is used as a justification for murder. A claim that the perpetrator is protecting themselves from the same sex past or attempted sexual assault. Some call it the I only killed him because he was coming on to me defense. Since the 1960s, it's reported that the defense has been used in about half of all states with success in a number of these cases. It's hard to track exactly how many cases this defence has been used in, especially successfully, because the FBI doesn't collect information about the sexual orientation or sexual identity of homicide victims, nor does any federal source track how often the defence is used in murder trials. Back in 2013, the American Bar Association called to put an end to the use of gay panic defences, condemning it entirely by saying that they were historical artefacts of a time when hatred of queer people was widespread. It was on the back of this that California banned the use, the first state to do so. In its condemnation of the defence, the ABA listed numerous infamous cases of its use, and I want to read this verbatim off an article on advocate.com, which will of course be linked in its entirety down below. It reads, Jorge Steven Lopez Mercado, aged 19, was decapitated, dismembered and burned for being openly gay. But according to the police investigator on the case, people who live this lifestyle need to be aware that this will happen. When Matthew Shepard, aged 21, made a pass at two men in a gay bar, he should have expected to be beaten, pistol whipped, tied to a fence and left to die. When Emile Bernard was stabbed, beaten and blinded after coming onto a hitchhiker, his assailant claimed he could not be guilty since the victim was asking for trouble by making sexual advances. If Angie Zapata, age 18, hadn't initially hidden that she had male anatomy, her attacker would never have bludgeoned her to death with a fire extinguisher. And when a fellow student shot Larry King, age 15, execution style in front of their teacher and classmates, his actions were understandable because Larry wore dresses and heels and said, love you baby, to him the day before. These are actual defences offered by real defendants in United States courts of law that have succeeded in mitigating or excusing real crimes even today. The first US state that banned the defence was California, as I said, in 2014, followed by Illinois in 2017. Over the following years, it has recently banned in Rhode Island, Connecticut, Hawaii, Maine, Nevada, New York, New Jersey, Washington, Colorado, and just this year in Virginia, Oregon, and Vermont. There is progress without a doubt here, and more states are in consideration of banning it. The New York bill banning the defense provides a non-violent sexual advance or the discovery of a person's sexual orientation or gender identity cannot serve as a reasonable explanation or excuse needed to reduce charges from murder to manslaughter. Many other states' bills have very similar wording to that. 
The key word here is a non-violent advance. The defence is also still legal here in the UK and is often referred to as the Portsmouth defence. But just because change has started doesn't mean it's going to be seen all the way through to the end. So activism and awareness is still needed to ensure that every single state makes a change and hopefully many more countries. According to LGBTbar.org, the gay panic, trans panic or LGBTQ plus panic defence in the USA can be used three ways to mitigate a case of murder down to manslaughter or justified homicides. There's the claim of insanity or diminished capacity, where the defendant alleges a sexual proposition by the victim triggered a nervous breakdown causing them to panic. This was the angle taken in possibly the most notorious use of this defence in the 1998 case of Matthew Shepard. I have made a full video on this which will be linked on the screen and down below. Then there's the defence of provocation, where a defendant argues that the victim's proposition was sufficiently provocative enough to induce them to kill the victim. This usually refers to behaviour which coming from a person of their preferred gender would not be considered harmful, but coming from an LGBTQ plus person, it is harmful. And then finally, there's the self-defence angle where defendants claim that they believe the victim, because of their sexual or gender identity, was about to cause the defendant serious bodily harm, and that the victim's identity makes them more of a threat to safety than if they were straight and or cisgender. It seems that it's the latter that Daniel Spencer's case falls into here. Since James Miller had never been in trouble with the police before, he had no criminal history, the defence argued that the only possible explanation could be that Daniel had tried to sexually assault him, or at the very least had come on to him. Miller wasn't a violent man until a gay man tried to make a pass. How many times a week, a day, do you hear of men making unwanted passes against women, who in general are in the same position the defence claimed Miller to be in, smaller, intimidated? But how often do you then hear of them stabbing the man because of this unwanted pass? The defence would later be forced to deny that they used the gay panic defence in this case, but like, this is what they use without so much as saying the words. The defence admitted that Miller didn't have a single scratch on him, Miller has said that Daniel made no threats to harm him, but the one thing he did do was allegedly make a move on him. And again, bear in mind that there's no real evidence of this, it's the defence's word against prosecutions. But James Miller feeling threatened by Daniel making a pass at him was reason enough to justify his murder in court. Prosecutor Matthew Foy said, it can't possibly be immediately necessary to use deadly force if no one is attempting to use force against you. Surely before grabbing the knife in your pocket, there would be some kind of physical altercation. And why did he have a knife in his pocket in the first place? And the fact that Daniel was stabbed twice suggests that this wasn't defence. If that was the case, most people would stab once and try to escape a scary situation twice suggests that something further was intended. But the defence said that the fact that Miller turned himself in should work in his favour when it came to the jury's deliberations. At the completion of the trial, the jury deliberated for 10 hours before they reached an impasse. They couldn't make a decision. So the judge encouraged some further deliberation and eventually they delivered a verdict of guilty. But not for murder or even manslaughter. James Miller was found guilty of criminally negligent homicide, which in a nutshell is any type of accidental death which is caused by reckless or negligent behaviour of an individual. The gay panic defence worked, he got his charge down from murder to negligent homicide, it wasn't his fault, it was an accident. And Miller was to face anywhere between 2 to 10 years in prison, it was now just up to the jury to finalise a sentence. As he'd never been previously convicted of a felony before, he was immediately eligible for probation. Despite the incredibly light conviction here, the lead defence attorney stated that he was startled and surprised by even this lesser conviction. They thought he was going to get off. Stating that all evidence and testimony proved that his client acted in self-defence and that he was no threat to the community as a whole 
which is just crazy to me because this whole thing is based on Miller's words. But hey, I'm not a professional in any sense of the word, so who am I to judge? The jury was sent away again to deliberate the sentence in this case, and they came back recommending that Miller serve just 10 years probation, something which the judge was required to honour. However, the judge did also add a maximum allowed six months jail time, 100 hours of community service and $11,000 in restitution to Daniel's family. And Miller was to use a portable alcohol monitoring device for at least a year to be reassessed after the year is up. That year would have been up over two years ago and I couldn't find any information as to the judge's decision on this, so I guess he just did it for a year. The defence said that by giving Miller just probation, the jury had agreed that he was no longer a threat to the community or to society at large, whilst the prosecution noted that the jury's decision showed that they rejected Miller's self-defence claim and made it clear that Daniel was the victim. The prosecutor said to NBC News, They spent a lot of time deliberating, which I think shows they took the case very seriously. But I feel that by convicting him of criminally negligent homicide, the jury rejected the self-defence claim and any aspect of it. Although, of course, they did give Miller significant allowance here, as they convicted him with a much lesser charge than murder or even manslaughter. This is a really complex case to analyse, and the truth is there were no other witnesses to say exactly what it is that happened that night. But with Miller admitting that Daniel never touched him, nor even threatening to touch him, it does seem that the defence leaned on the potential kiss attempt to get Miller off. And you can see why this is problematic. It enforces the stereotype that gay men are predatory, that straight men should be scared of them making a move at any time. The fact that this doesn't even count as murder enforces the notion that LGBT lives are worth less than those of straight. Bear in mind again that we don't know for sure that Daniel Spencer wasn't straight, but regardless, that is what the defence leaned on in this case. There are so many cases I could have used in this episode to discuss the use of gay panic, but this is the most recent one that I could find detailed online. I wanted to illustrate how the defence is still being used to this day and successfully used at that. If you do want to learn about another example of this defence being used, however, unsuccessfully, I would recommend my video on Matthew Shepard, which again will be linked down below. I do think allowing use of gay or trans panic defences in court sets a very dangerous precedent. It allows people to be murdered just for the fact they're gay. Regardless or not, if somebody actually makes a move on somebody else, somebody could stand up in court and say, he tried to kiss me and therefore I'm justified to act in self-defence, I'm justified to stab him, I'm justified to assault him or her. Which may or may not be exactly what happened in this case. We don't know for sure if Daniel tried to kiss James Miller, but what we know is that he said he did and that was justification for a murder. Of course, I do want to stress there is very much a difference between a violent sexual assault, a violent move on somebody not accepting no for an answer, and just leaning in for a kiss. They're two very different things, and one is justification for self-defense, and one probably is not. But then again, a lot of people who are against the banning of the gay panic defense say that it's hard to know where the line is. When does a pass at somebody cross the line from a harmless leaning for a kiss and a violent assault? At what point does it become the other? As I said earlier in the video, straight men make passes at women every single day and very, very rarely, if ever, do you hear of a woman turning around and saying, yeah, I stabbed him because he made a move on me in a club. So why can that be used justification when a gay man makes a move on a straight man? Is it just fragile masculinity? And of course that doesn't happen every time, but it does happen a lot more than it should and we as a society need to be looking at why. Why is it so terrifying for a straight man to be seen as anything other than straight? That's something that society enforces and that needs to be fixed. Before I end this video, I just really quickly want to say that I recently recorded a video for the Prime Video UK YouTube channel in which I discussed the best true crime stories they have on the platform. I'm really proud of how that video turned out and you know I love any excuse to talk about movies I love and true crime. 
So if you want to go and check the video out, I'll leave a link in the description box and on the end screen of this video. And I would really appreciate you going over there and just showing some support. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.